Nitya initially emailed me and asked if I would uh, do the special music. And I offered to sing, but nobody seems to get excited about that. Uh, there are friends of mine who, when we organize a mehfil, a ghazal mehfil, they say if people don't want to leave, at the end of the night, just get Pastor Fiji to sing, and everybody <laughs> will leave. So uh, I, I, I will not uh, sing, uh, but I will uh, play, uh, a, 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 I don't know how special, but a number, but uh, I remember, I need to remind that uh, in church, whether we read the Bible, scripture reading, or whether we uh, pray, whether we sing, we do it on behalf of the entire congregation. So when somebody sings special music or plays special music, it's not a person who's doing a performance. It's not a performance. This is praising God on behalf of everybody. Amen. Uh, so I will uh, play a song. I think uh, I want always to play a song that people know so you can relate to uh, the, the music. Uh, it's a song that you all know, Fairest Lord, Lord Jesus. And I'll play the verses twice. Let's go, uh, go through the tune twice. And then we'll open God's Word and uh, see what God has uh, that He can share with us today. Okay. Pastor says that that was nice. <laughs> but I don't get an often an opportunity to play uh, the harmonica. But I, when I was a kid, I used to in Sabbath mornings at Kingsway College and get up before everybody on Sabbath morning. And when you go to Kingsway, you see behind the parking lot there's a valley down there, and good weather. I should take my harmonica there early, early in the morning, six o'clock, seven o'clock, sit there and play for hours. And I had a great time. And uh, now it just, time doesn't permit. But it's wonderful to be able to praise God in music. I want to uh, open uh, our minds, our hearts, and our scriptures to uh, chapter 24 of Joshua. I'm going to try very hard over the next few weeks to focus on understanding our relationship with God as created beings. Too often, we insert our own ideas into that relationship. It's like marriage. When two people come together, they each come from a different family, and each has an idea as to what the family is going to be like. The husband comes into a relationship thinking, oh, this is what I'm going to be like. 
I will do these things and my wife will do these things and we're going to have kids like this because they have their own culture from their own family. And the wife, she comes into the marriage thinking, oh, okay, this is what marriage is going to be like. And too often, it's a big difference in what the expectations are. And the best way to figure out what a good marriage is, is to go to the Bible. Because it tells us what the roles of the man and the woman are, and the children and so on. But also, when it comes to a relationship with God, too often we create in our own minds what we think is a right and acceptable activity that God wants from me. So I come into a relationship with God, I come into worship with an expectation that this is what I think God wants. And so I insert into that relationship my own idea of what it is that God wants. Rather than seeking and looking to find out what is it that God wants, so I can submit to His will and do what He wants me to do. Amen. At the end of the day, we have to recognize and acknowledge that the only relationship that we have with God is this. Now we submit ourselves to Him and He guides us and tells us what to do. That's it. But in order to find out what His will is, we need to go to the Bible. Every human being has in us, has in them, a desire to worship God. Every human being has a desire to worship. There are those who call themselves atheists. But although they may be atheists, they call themselves atheists, and they believe in the state that there is no God, but even in them there is a desire to worship. Whether they choose to worship themselves and their knowledge, whether they decide to worship their profession or their degree or their wealth is a different question. But in every human mind is a desire to worship. And through that desire, people around the world, whether they live in the jungles of India or South America, or Africa, they all create for themselves, in their mind and in their culture, a God that they can worship. Sometimes they have, many times they have many gods that they can worship. The why, why do they do it? Because we have a desire to worship. And that desire was put there by the Creator, who created us so that we may have this relationship, that we may do what? We may worship. God put that there, that we may worship Him. And as we begin to worship, there is this fight in heaven because Lucifer decides that he also desires to be worshipped. As a result of that, humanity leaves God and leaves that responsibility of worshipping the Creator and they begin to create these gods and they begin to worship those gods. And we find that when humanity left God and began to worship and create pagan gods who really represented Lucifer, God began to put, in, put into play a way to bring humanity back to himself. He reached out to Abraham and says, Through you I will bless how many nations? All, all nations. All nations. Through you I will bless all nations. But even after Abraham, the children of Israel, continuously, after Jacob, the children of Israel, continuously left God. And God will bring them back. Then God gave the commandments to Moses after 400 years of slavery. Once again, the people would continuously leave God and begin to worship 
other gods. And God would, through discipline, bring them back to himself. Now we find the children of Israel. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years, waiting to get into Canaan. Everybody has died except for two people that left Egypt. Joshua leads them into Canaan. And they divide up the territory of this new promised land into the various territories for the 12 tribes. The fighting is pretty much over. The Canaanites are under control. And Joshua has become an old man. And he is about to die in his old age. He's done his mission. And in preparation for his death, he calls together initially in chapter 23 of Joshua, he calls together the elders of Israel in chapter 23. And then after he has his meeting with the elders, in chapter 23, in chapter 24, he goes and he says, call all of the people of Israel because he wants to talk to them and remind them of their covenant with God. And this is where we find our story today. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel. Chapter 24 of the book of Joshua, verse 1. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, and the officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Before we go any further, let me tell you about this place called Shechem. This was the mountain where God had made all the deals with the various people, with Jacob. This is where Jacob had sent his son Joseph to go and find his brothers. It was in Shechem that they used to have the pastures, the best pastures for the sheep. And when Joseph went to look for his brother, they caught him and threw him in a pit. This is that same place. It's that place now. Joshua has called these people and he's saying to them, come together. Verse 2, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped who? Other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, and but Jacob and to his sons, they went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your fathers out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with the chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help. And he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did with the Egyptians. Then you lived in the desert for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you. And you took possession of the land. When Balak the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did all the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Gerasites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornets ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, the two Amorite kings. You did not do it on your own sword and bow, so I gave you the land which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. 
Throw away your gods your forefathers worshipped before the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if the serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose you yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God Himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt and the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out all the nations, including the Amorites, who live in the land. We will serve the Lord because He is our God. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after He has been good to you. But the people said, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a what? Covenant, Covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these in the book near to the holy place, uh, the book of the law. Then he took a large stone and set it up and there under the oak near the holy place. See, he said to all the people, the stone will be a witness against us. It, was, it has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are what? If you deny the Lord, if you deny the Lord, the stone will be a witness against you. And you are a witness yourself that you have made a commitment to God. Wow. What a story. What has God done here? What is the concern here? What is God concerned about? Verse 2 tells us, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Long ago your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nehor, lived beyond the rivers, rivers and they did what? They worshipped other gods. other gods. What is this entire chapter about? It is about serving God. That is the whole responsibility of a believer, is to worship God. That is it. Worship God. Then Joshua goes and explains. He says, look what he did to, Cain, uh, to Abraham. Look how he brought Abraham. And this is to verse 4. Then from verse 5 to verse 7, he goes by story of the children of Israel. Moses and Aaron, the children of Israel. Look what God did. You didn't do anything by your power. God did it for you. Then he goes on further. How did he bring you into Canaan? Joshua, it wasn't your armies that conquered Canaan. It was you. It was God. This is our story. This is our story. Not too many generations ago, our parents, our fathers, our mothers, Worship other gods in other lands. Idols. Hindus they were. Gentiles, if you will. In a world where they were cursed. God then brought them out of that worship of pagan gods. And by generation, from generation to generation, now we are, after multiple generations, we are now, as Joshua and the children of Israel were. 
sitting before God. And we are called to question where and how and whom we worship. That same God who brought them through difficulties has brought you from a faraway land into this land. But do you know what happened to the children of Israel after making the promise, after they promised Joshua how many times? Not once, not twice, but how many times? Three times. We will do what God wants us to do. And Joshua says, you can't do it. Oh no, we will. We will obey God. But do you know what happened? The children of Israel, they all had this land given to them. Everybody had a property. Everybody had a home given to them. They began to build their homes. They began to plant their gardens. They began to plant their fields. They began to do the work that they were meant to do. And they became a very successful nation, economically, financially. And what happened to their relationship with God? They lost. They lost. Why did they lose it? Because rather than focusing on the work that God had given to them, they made that the secondary. By the way, when I have time, I will worship. When I have time, I will do God's work. But until then, I've got other things to do. When God asked for sacrifices, he didn't say, bring me the lamb that's going to die anyway. Bring me the lamb that is sick. He didn't say, bring me the one that you don't want. He said, what? Get me one that is perfect, which is faultless, which is completely beautiful. When he said to Abraham, he didn't say, sacrifice for me that which you don't want. He didn't say, give me a servant. He didn't say, give me all your camels. He didn't say, give me all your wealth. He said, what? Give me that which you love the most. When God gives us what he has given us, my father used to pray, thanking God to bring us to Canada. Although my mother always wasn't too happy about being in Canada when we first arrived. He would say, thank you for bringing us to the land of milk and honey. Thank you for bringing us to the land of plenty. And we all do. We've all come from backgrounds that are not easy. But how easily we forget where we have come from and who brought us here. We, like the children of Israel, we stand up and say, we will do what you say. But it doesn't take long when our obligations, which we put on ourselves, we make bigger plans for ourselves than we should, and we become completely preoccupied with trying to fulfill those plans for a temporal life. Here, Joshua is concerned about the people of Israel. And as you know, those of us that have studied, that in Egypt, uh, when they came out of Egypt, the children of Israel, each person was, each man of the house was responsible for their family. Spoke for their family. Here we see the verse 15. If serving the Lord seems, in the King James we'll find the word evil. If serving the Lord seems evil to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. We have to serve somebody. You know why? Because we, all humans, are made to worship. 
We have to worship somebody. What I'm telling you about humans made to worship, it's not my information, it's scientific information. We're made to worship. So now that we have to worship somebody, who are we going to choose? We can either take this God that we have in the Bible, and we can change that God to suit our personality. We make Him whatever we want. Becomes like going to the Mandarin. Ever been to the Mandarin restaurant? You can go in there, there's like 5,000 dishes to choose from. You make, your own menu. you make your own menu. Nobody has to say anything. Do whatever you want. And everybody leaves there satisfied. I go there with a friend every now and then. I haven't seen him for a while, but I, I used to get embarrassed to go there with him. Because he'd eat for three hours. <laughs> And then when he was done, you know, they bring you this hot cloth to wash your hands. He would ask for two. He, one, he'd wash hands. The other one, he'd take and put it on his face and sit there for a while. Breathe really heavy because he'd eaten too much. So we create in our own minds this, this image of a God that suits us. And we satisfy ourselves that we are so spiritual based on that God. But if it seems evil to you to serve God, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers, whether we're going to serve our money, whether we're going to serve our goals, our objectives. But as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. When we look at that sentence, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In that statement that he makes, there is a built-in assumption that me and my family, we will serve the Lord, but there is a good chance that you may not. That accusation is built into Joshua's statement. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, but you may not. We have to examine this passage, not only in the context of our individual families, but we have to examine this passage in the context of this church family, you understand. I want to stop for just a moment, take a, what they call in drama and, and, and aside. Church is not for those that don't believe in Jesus Christ as a Savior. But anybody who believes that Jesus Christ is the Savior and gives us eternal life, brings us to God, for eternal life is a member of the Church of Christ. So, we are not to bring people into the church who have not accepted Jesus Christ. Church is not a place for evangelism. I know you may have heard differently, but church is not the place for evangelism. Church is a place where believers in Jesus Christ can come together and say thank you to God for saving us Amen. and learn that we may go out and share the love of God with people around us. Amen. That is the work of the church. This is worship. That's work. And somebody who doesn't accept God through Jesus Christ cannot worship with believers. There's no room. Therefore, I have been studying with Hindus, mostly Hindus, and people of other faiths, but not in church. They only come to church when they accept Jesus Christ. As part of my aside, I will also take note that many times today, from Sabbath school on, I have heard Although we are few, although we are few, 
there is no need for that observation or an apology. I'll tell you why. When we look for church growth, when we look for church growth, it is a mistake to think that church growth means that we should look for more numbers. Church growth is about taking the church that you have and having that church grow spiritually into Jesus Christ. Amen. That is church growth. When the church grows spiritually, the numbers will take care of themselves. But if we look for numbers to see if we can fill this just for the sake of filling it so our church looks good and we can pat ourselves on the back, that becomes a selfish motivation. And we have not to be part of that selfish motivation. Our only motivation ought to be that we don't want to bring people to church. We want to bring people to the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then, whatever church, wherever they want to go, they go. That's okay. But our objective is to bring them to Jesus Christ. Not in church, where we are. I noticed last night, I think we had more people in Bible study than we'd have here today. That is growing and every week, I know a list of those that are going to be attending. Every week we have additional people coming. But that is because we love the Lord and we want to promote the Word of God. Now, as a church family, we need to keep that covenant that Joshua made that Joshua made with the people. And that was what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So when we talk about me and my house, we ought to look at that not so much as individual families, although that is important. But this family, this church family, we ought to make a commitment to ourselves and to God to make that covenant. Then as for us and this house, this family, we will reject all others and serve only the God of the Bible that we know. And when we do that, when we follow the Word of God, He will bless us and give us the spiritual rest that we need and give us the boldness to go and share the Word of God with those that we love. Last night it was mentioned in Bible study that if we love somebody, much more important than giving them money, much more important than giving them a job, much more important than giving them food, is sharing the message of everlasting life with them. Amen. That becomes our responsibility. And you notice that when Joshua called the people. He called the leaders of Israel. All the leaders. What that tells us in this family is that no matter what department you're working with, whether it's Sabbath school, whether it's communications, whether it's youth, whether it's uh, treasury, whatever department you're with, every department has the same job. And that is to go and spread the Word of God to our friends and people outside the church and congregation. It is my desire that as God transforms your lives, that He transform my life and take control of our lives in a way like never before. So this little church, this group, can become a source, a tool for God to do His work and bring God's Word to every corner of our lives where we live, where we work, where we go to school, and where we have our secular activities, that we can praise God and worship Him on a regular and daily basis. God bless you. Amen.
word. We trust you, dear God, to submit all that we are and all that we hope to be into your hands. And so it is that into your hands we commit our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.